This morning we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15 for our Old Testament reading. There are times when I struggle to find an Old Testament text that is at least tangentially connected to our New Testament text. This is not one of those. <laughs> this is at the heart of what our New Testament text is also going to be dealing with. So I'll read Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 11. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debts. This is the manner of remission. Every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it from his neighbor and his brother, because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. From a foreigner you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever is yours with your brother. However, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God, and observe carefully all this commandment which I am commanding you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. A voluntary generosity to the poor and the needy. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 4. As we pick up in the closing verses, I'll be reading verses 32 through 37 of Acts chapter 4. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, we thank you for your church and for how you have governed her and ruled over her. And Lord, bless us now as we consider this picture, this window into the life of your church in those early days of the book of Acts. Bless us that we might live in the light of your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turbulent times can be either very good or very destructive 
for the church of Jesus Christ. Strife produces stress, and stress can lead to distrust, dissension, disunity, and division. But it need not necessarily be a destructive force. The storms of life can unify the people of God and strengthen their resolve. The stress produced by strife can actually prove to be a positive experience if the church responds to it correctly, if the church redeems the opportunity. Now, from all the signs, those difficult days for the first century church yielded mostly good results rather than negative outcomes. Which is simply to observe that how the church reacts to persecution and pressure is key to their overall survival and success. God gave them grace, which enabled them to respond in faith. Now make no mistake, the storms assaulting the early church are already bad and they're growing worse. We cannot diminish the attacks of the enemies. But through the grace of Jesus Christ, this conflict becomes a fertile field for spiritual growth within the Christian community. And here is a lesson that we need to learn. As external attacks assail us. They don't have to destroy us. God can use those very trials to bind us together and to make us more effective in ministry. So this morning as we walk about the text, I want to look first at the life of the early church. Then we're going to see word and deed ministry and finish with, posit uh, with Barnabas's positive example. Well, the days that are described here in our text were really heady times for the early church. There were many different dynamics at play, including the powerful preaching of the gospel, large numbers of conversions, and growing opposition from the Sanhedrin. Peter and John had been arrested by the Jewish leadership, held overnight in prison, and then harassed the next morning by the ruling council of Judaism. They had been told in no uncertain terms that they must stop speaking, preaching, and teaching in the name of Jesus. Jesus' name was now outlawed by the high priest and his associates. The apostles were then threatened by their Jewish counterparts, and they had to choose whether to obey God or man. It's not uncommon then when people face stress in one area of their life, it migrates into other areas of their life. A bad relationship at work with your boss will sometimes lead you to be short-tempered and argumentative with your spouse or your children at home. And sometimes we let strife in one part of our life lead us to sin in other areas of life. But that's not what we see here in the early church. These outward attacks aren't causing them to fight against each other. But instead, we see quite the opposite taking place. In response to that outside, outward pressure, we find that the congregation of believers is united. It says, they were of one heart and soul. This is not an outward organizational unity where you're saying, well, we're all going by the same name. We're all Presbyterians. We all have Presbyterian on our sign outside our churches. So we're unified outwardly. No, this is an inward and a deep unity of heart and soul. The heart and the soul are the very essence and the core of life. 
And so they are united together. Unity, not division, is the result of this persecution. And the church becomes the eye of the storm. The one place of calm and peace in the midst of chaos and confusion. In the recent hurricane that came through the Bahamas, I remember seeing some footage taken from one of those islands in the eye. It was amazing. It was calm. The sun was shining. It's like there was no storm. But if you look down on the radar map, all around, completely encircling that little spot, is this horrific storm which is tearing things apart. The eye is the place of safety. And that's what the church really is. It's the eye of the storm. Well, not only was there unity of heart and soul, but there is also a positive concern and care for the needy in their midst. Now, when it says in verse 34 that there was not a needy person among them, that doesn't mean that only well-to-do people were joining the church. No, some needy people did become Christians, including slaves and others from the lower strata of society. But what Luke conveys here to us is that no one was left as needy. And that is because of a voluntary generosity that began spontaneously welling up within the church. We don't hear the apostles haranguing the people to give and give again, give till it hurts, and then give some more. There's no manipulation, there's no pushing, there's no top-down, heavy-handed demands. No, this is springing up. It's welling up a voluntary generosity, not a forced or coerced generosity, but a voluntary generosity. So those who had property were altogether happy to sell their lands or their houses. If they had possessions, they shared them freely and generously. No one clung to their private property, insisting that it belongs only to them as their own. But it says, no, they deemed all things to be common property among them. Now just to go back, rewind to a previous sermon, this is not socialism, this is not communism, this is not the government saying your property now is going to be redistributed. So don't read this as early Christian communism. It's voluntary. It's given freely. No one's asking. No one's demanding. No one's coercing, which you always have in socialism and communism. But rather, this is a willing generosity of people saying to themselves, why not give this to help my poor and needy brother? I mean, you can just almost envision this. A couple sitting around their table in their home in Jerusalem saying, you know, we're seeing the needs with these various people who have come into the church. And, you know, we have that nice vacation villa up on the Sea of Galilee. And we've got a boat there that we like to take out often and go water skiing on the Sea of Galilee. How about if we just sell that? and give the money to help these poor, needy brethren. There's something very beautiful about a voluntary generosity like this, of saying, you know what, yeah, I have these things, but I hold them very loosely. And it's far more important that I help my needy brethren that I cling so tightly to my toys. I'm not against toys. 
Toys are okay. I have some toys. But you always have to hold them loosely. And if there is some priority that takes place over my enjoyment, then I would rather forfeit my toys to help my brethren. That's the spirit that we're seeing here in the early church. So what we really see is voluntary generosity as a defining mark within this congregation. They were so ready to help that it indicates that they alleviated poverty from within the ranks of those early Christians. This is one of the many effects of the gospel. They had come to love God with all their heart, and that meant that they should love their neighbor as themselves. So if they saw someone in need and had the means to meet the need and to help, they displayed the love of Christ by liquidating some of their private assets and then making those resources available for diaconal relief. Now, there are times where needs come up and we say, I just don't have any way to help that. And, and that's okay. That, that's perfectly legitimate. Say, you know, I'm seeing this need over here and there's just nothing I can do. Well, fine. Well, don't feel guilty about that. But then there are needs that arise where I say, you know what? I do have the means to help. And yeah, it would require some sacrifice on my behalf. But I'm willing to sacrifice for the good of others. And this becomes a defining mark. As people thought about the church in Jerusalem, and remember, this church has grown to over 5,000. What would people say about it? That's a giving church. That's a generous church. That's a church that takes care of their own and who are willing to sacrifice for each other. It's a church that does not have any poor among them because they have taken care of each other so well. Now, as for the apostles, the apostles carried out the very same type of ministry that our Lord Jesus had modeled for them. They had a word and deed ministry. Now, I know you've heard me talk about this before, but let me again refresh this idea in your minds. In ministry, there needs to be a strong emphasis on the word, the word of God, being explained and expounded. But there should also be a deed ministry. Deeds of mercy that exhibit the truth being conveyed by the word. These two things go together, and they serve one another. If you have a word ministry, and there are no deeds going along with it, well then those words will seem empty and hollow. It's just so much talk. It's not ideal. Unbelievers will dismiss it as mere Christian bluster. But on the other hand, if there are only deeds and no words, then nobody really knows what the deeds actually mean. Deeds need words to explain them. And so you've got to have the deeds explained by the word so the deeds are seen in their proper context. Now when these two things go together, words and deeds, then the words explain the deeds and the deeds confirm and exhibit the truth of the words. Now if you recall Jesus' ministry, you'll remember that he frequently taught the truth. He employed many words. Now, I'm generally not impressed with red-letter editions of the Bible. I think that's kind of artificial. But it does highlight the fact that in the Gospels, there's a lot of red letters. <laughs> Jesus talks a lot. But on the other hand, he also healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He even raised the dead to life again. 
So he was always busy with great works of ministry, which were a necessary accompaniment to his powerful preaching and teaching. Did he have a word ministry? Yes, he did. Did he have a deed ministry? Yes, he did. Did those two complement each other? Of course they did. That is Jesus' model for ministry. And again, this is what we find the apostles doing. Verse 33 tells us that with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And those are words. It is a preaching and teaching ministry. But then we also find them receiving the proceeds from these property sales. It says the money was brought and laid at the apostles' feet. And they would then distribute to any such as had need. And this means that the apostles played an administrative role. They were dispersing funds based on their assessments of the needs of individuals within their congregation. And this must have been an enormous task. Our congregation has just over 100 people. And we have some deacons. And the deacons pretty much cover the bases pretty well. Our deacons aren't really uh, overstressed at too many points. Think about if our congregation had 7,500, because it was 5,000 men plus women and children, so 7,500, maybe 10,000. And you've got 12 apostles who are receiving all of these proceeds and then making decisions about who gets what. Twelve apostles who are also preaching and teaching and doing everything else. Now it's no wonder that in just a couple chapters they're going to say, we need deacons. <laughs> Get us some deacons because we can't handle this. We need to concentrate on the word and prayer. We need deacons. But, but right now in this early phase, they're doing that. It's a tremendous, tremendous work. And so it's not an either or, it's a both and. Yes, they preached and taught. Yes, they managed and dispersed the diaconal funds. The preaching explains the giving. The giving confirms the truth that is being preached. It's word and deed ministry. But notice, too, that there was great power on the apostles and abundant grace upon them all. God was pleased to pour out his grace and power on his servants, even as they carried out this vital ministry. The gospel is going forth with power, the grace of God flowing freely. And this is what we should pray for and what we should expect. The God of heaven is not indifferent towards the progress of his gospel. God is not aloof to the spreading of the good news and the kingdom of Christ. He wishes it to go forward, and he furthers its progress. You know, without power, without his power, we really can do nothing, either in word or in deed. And without his grace, even our best efforts will have no positive effect. But when he is showering great power and abundant grace upon his active and obedient servants, then we see the blessings of God in a very visible and tangible way. This is when the church grows in very healthy regards, and the church becomes all that God intends her to be. You know, we really should not be satisfied with that type of church growth that is actually stimulated by marketing strategies or a business model. That's false growth. It's pseudo-growth. You know, I bet you we could get hundreds of people to come to Grace Church if during refreshment time, we offered free beer. 
Oh, they would come through these doors. Man, we would have to build an expansion. You can manipulate people. Sure you can. Or as one church, this is down in Texas, I think. All the crazy things come out of Texas. They start paying people to come to church. We'll give you a $5 bill if you show up at church. Well, of course there's a lot of people who show up to get a $5 bill. You know, these kind of manipulative business model marketing techniques that is so popular in the evangelical world these days is false growth. What we want is growth that arises from the gospel, not manipulative, superficial methods of rearranging people not just growth by the sheer number of noses that come through the door. We want healthy, real, substantial growth that comes when God gives his power and displays his grace and his faithful servants are doing their work and the people of God are responding. That's real growth. That's what we should pray for. It's what we should long for and yearn for when there is a word and deed ministry carried on in God's great power and abundant grace. Yeah, things grow. And so as we think about our church and as we pray for our church, this is what we should be praying. Lord, make the word and deed ministry go forth in your power. Manifest your abundant grace. And Take a hold of people's lives and transform them. Bring those who are lost in and take those who are your servants, who are your children, and grow them in that grace. Now at this point in the text, Luke introduces to us two examples. One is positive, the other is negative. The negative example is that of Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. And we will look at them in a few weeks. But the positive example is that of one Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth. He's better known to us as Barnabas. And there's a few things that we learn here about Barnabas that introduce this good man to us. As indicated in verse 36, Barnabas was a Levite. His proper Jewish name was Joseph, a rather common and a somewhat famous Jewish name. Joseph the patriarch, the prime minister of Egypt, comes to mind. Well, as any good Jew would do, Barnabas knew his tribal identity. He was from the tribe priestly tribe of Levi. And the Levites were those minor religious officials who assisted in the worship and service, first of the tabernacle and later in the temple. How exactly a family of Levites came to be on the island of Cyprus, we do not know. And yet it was there in Cyprus that his pregnant mother gave birth to this little boy, Joseph. And now, in later years, he is back in Jerusalem, and he has property at his disposal. Now, one of the more interesting things about Barnabas is that he was not really called Joseph by the apostles. They knew his name, but rather, they nicknamed him Barnabas. And this nickname is a very significant name. It shows their regard for this Levite. Because his name, Barnabas, means son of encouragement. We're going to see him in Acts again. And when we find him in Acts, we will find him mostly mainly to be an encourager. Now, there are plenty of people that you and I know 
who we might call sons of discouragement, (laughs) sons of complaining, sons of gripers that always have some negative spin to put on things. But not this man. This man made it his mission to encourage others. So when Saul of Tarsus is converted and is starting to preach and people are really suspicious, oh, this is the guy that was throwing us in prison. We can't trust him. It's the son of encouragement, Barnabas, who seeks him out and who brings him into the Christian circle. Oh, to be a son of encouragement. So this son of encouragement, Barnabas the Levite, apparently began to see a need. There were those in his own home church in Jerusalem who lacked some of the necessities of life. Barnabas also knew that he possessed something of real value, attractive land, So of his own volition, Barnabas decided to sell that land and bring the money to the apostles to be distributed. Barnabas took the full amount of what he had received from the transaction and he laid it at the apostles' feet. He trusted the apostles to take and to use that money for the very best purposes. He wanted to encourage those who were needy in his church, and this was a prime way for him to do so. So you see, Barnabas's encouragement is not just a theoretical type of encouragement. Oh, I'm going to sit at home and think encouraging thoughts. No, he says, you know what? There's a need. I know that need. I've seen that need. Now, they they may not even be asking, but there's a need there. And here's this tract of land. And I know it's not a bad tract of land. I know I can get some good cash out of this land. What do I need land for? I'm, I'm willing to sell it. Easy come, easy go. If I let that land go for sale, how does that diminish me or my worth? So he puts it on the market. It sells. He takes the full amount, not like Ananias and Sapphira will do, but the full amount, and he says, here, Peter, here, John, here, James, use this. And by the way, there's there's a need over there. Could you use it for that need? Again, it's this voluntary generosity in the heart of a son of encouragement. Now, what would have been if Barnabas had said, yeah, you know what? I see the need. But you know what? They're they're just going to have to make their own way in life. They're going to have to figure this out for themselves. I can't be solving everyone else's problem. I'm not called upon... Besides, this is, this is prime land, and I've got plans for my land. And, and it's too valuable to waste it on this ne'er-do-well who probably got himself into the trouble he's in. What, what would that be? Would that be encouragement? Uh, that would be discouragement. That would be pressing despair on the needy. Being a Levite, I think it's reasonable to say that Barnabas knew Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 11. And what he does is so closely tied to that passage that it's uncanny, the connection there. He sees, he freely gives, he has no grasping self-interest, and he actually encourages someone who may have been downcast. As believers in Christ, we too 
today can and should respond to the gospel with this sort of voluntary generosity. As we see needs, we should not close our hearts to our needy brethren, but we should consider how we can help them. And yea, even if that means that we liquidate some asset we own in order to do so, so be it. For as our Lord Jesus taught us, it is far better to give than to receive. We must not close our hearts to those who have legitimate needs. But instead, we should give of our bounty to help those who are most needy. And in this way, the church confirms the call of the gospel through acts of love and kindness. Just as Christ gave himself for us in our need, so we give of ourselves to help those who have needs. It's a gospel response. And that's what we're called to. You and I live in an incredibly selfish culture. A culture that says, accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. It should sicken us to see that wretched bumper sticker, those who die with the most toys win. Not true, not true. That's selfishness, that's greed, that's pride, that's idolatry. The church that is marked by selfishness and by greed is completely denying their profession of the gospel. A church that gives of itself freely, who helps those who need help. That's a church that understands the gospel because this is the gospel response to the work of Christ. And it's what he calls us to do. So we have to fight against our culture. It's massaging us all the time. It's whispering in our ear, you need more. You won't be happy till you get more. If you get more, you'll be very happy. You'll be fulfilled. If you just buy that fancy car, it's going to bring everything together and make you complete. Those are lies. Every junkyard testifies to the lie. All the fancy cars end up, sooner or later, being crushed into scrap metal. We cannot go with our culture as it carries us down the stream of greed and selfishness and pride. We have to swim against the tide and say, no, we will be a generous people a people who give willingly and freely from the heart because of what God has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be free and generous, to be like Barnabas as we see needs and have ability to help, to actually help keep us from clasping our riches to our breast as if we can somehow carry them with us into eternity. Give us this kind of heart of willing generosity. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.